after death, then what? And this would be uh, a series for the next four weeks on the resurrection. The resurrection is momentous of what happened. But in a recent poll, 51% uh, believe that there is an afterlife, while 23% believe you'll just cease to exist after you die. 26% simply didn't know what would happen after death. That's what you call an agnostic. An agnostic is somebody that understands that some, there's something, a higher power above them, but they don't think, they think it's impossible to understand or the higher power and know what really happens. That's why we have the Bible. That's why Jesus Christ came to earth, because he reveals to us about God. But Stephen Hawking, he says, well, so if that's the case, 26%, you can actually say they do believe in afterlife. 51% do believe in afterlife. That's 77%. 23% don't? That's a lot. I mean, that's, we've gotten dumber, beloved, this country. Because it used to be 1% or 2% would be atheists. Now we're up to 23%. But Stephen Hawking, he's probably one of the leading uh, atheists out there, and they made a movie of him, like I said, two or three years ago. And I think it might have won Picture of the Year. But this is what he says, Stephen Hawking. He says, I regard the brain as a computer, which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. Another skeptic says, I have always felt that when I die, I am dead and gone. My conscious life will end. My interactions with others will end, and I will simply be gone. My afterlife will be in the memories of those I knew, those who loved me, those who carried me on their hearts, but I myself cease to exist. That's 23% of Americans believe that. Out of the 51% that do believe in afterlife, the opinions vary. You know, some think in terms of reincarnation, maybe some think in terms that you go to a shadowy place, is what the Egyptians believe, and then it, it, sooner or later you come in front for the final judgment. Others believe in a hedonistic abode, a kind of a celestial resort, indulging every whim and personal interest you can think of. In other words, it's human life on steroids. That's what most people think that are not Christians. But God tells us what happens in the afterlife. And uh, this week we're going to talk about the intermediate state. What happens at the moment you leave this earth till the moment Christ returns? What happens in that interim? And, and we'll hopefully answer that. But there are five things that historic Christianity have always believed about the afterlife. One, a disembodied existence between a person's death and the resurrection. In other words, we're talking 99% if not more of historic Christianity believe that when you die, your spirit goes to be with Jesus. Two, the bodily resurrection, this is what they, we've always believed, the bodily resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked at the second coming. Now, hold off of there for a second. The bodily resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked at the second coming. See, and this is going to be fleshed out a little bit more as we get into the intermediate state, but when Christ returns, his second coming is when we receive our resurrected bodies. That's when we receive our resurrected bodies. What about the people in hell or shale or abandonment? That's when they receive their resurrected bodies. But then, number three, a final judgment of the living and the dead according to what they have done during this earthly life. Now, this is just my opinion here, but so I think what historic Christianity is saying is that at Christ's second coming, we all receive our resurrected bodies. Those that are in hell have not received Christ, receive their resurrected bodies, but they stay in the place of where they're at right now until after the millennium. And then after the millennium, it's the final judgment, where they will stand before God in their resurrected bodies, 
And this is what Philippians is talking about. And bow their knee and confess that Christ is Lord and get thrown into hell. Hell's not open yet. Remember what it says in Revelation? Satan's the first one that gets thrown in the lake of fire. Hell's not open for business yet. Number four, the never-ending punishment of conscious torment in hell for those who are condemned at the last judgment. And number five, the everlasting reward of an immortal life with God for those who have been sanctified and perfected through faith in Jesus Christ. That's us. When The moment you die, the moment you die, and I'm going to prove this in Scripture here in a minute, your spirit goes directly with Christ, to Christ, and, and you are perfected as a spirit. But they, they, there's a day coming when Audrey, she knows right now, she knows, she's in perfect bliss as a spirit. Perfect bliss. In her mind, it can't get any better than this. But she knows that she will receive a resurrected body. She knows that, which means it's going to get better. And I believe that principle is with what heaven is, is going to continually get better and better and better as we progress through eternity. Hell, on the other hand, gets worse and worse and worse. This is the nature we have to deal with. So our, but you know what? What I just said, and we have to remember this, our future, uh, Resurrection has always been controversial. Always. Even with those who claim to be Christians. Now, during the New Testament, it was debated. This is why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15. It's exactly why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll get into it more next week, uh, was an answer to those that were denying the resurrection. Because he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, there were people saying that. But it's not what we might think, what they meant with that. You go over to 2 Timothy 2.18. 2 Timothy 2.18. Remember these verses. Matter of fact, I'll start at verse 17. And their message was spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philidius are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So there were people, that's why Paul wrote the way he did about the resurrection. There were people going around saying the resurrection has already passed. What did they mean by that? What they meant by that is that when you become born again, and this is why uh, it, 1 Corinthians 7 is written the way it was about marriage. This is why Ephesians was written the way it was. There was a group of people who believed that once they became born again, they, 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 had, they became born again. They had the resurrected spirits. Not bodies, but spirits. <coughs> and they believe that once you die, your spirit remains a spirit forever, for eternity. That's your resurrection. It's like the pagan belief that matter is evil, the human body is evil, and the spirit must be released from the human body to enjoy bliss. And this is where Christianity is different. And this is what Christ showed us in his resurrection. We are made in the image of God. Okay? And that means we have bodies. When Adam and Eve were created, they had a body and they had a spirit before sin came into the world. Once sin came into the world, the body decays and dies. The spirit lives on. But at God's timetable, at his second coming, he's going to re reunite us, our spirit, with our body. Now, Christ gave us the first fruits, is what they call it, is what Paul called it. When he rose from the dead in his spiritual body, that's our first fruit. And what a first fruit is for a gardener or a farmer, they go out and they, they would take a sample of their crop or their, their tree to see what, and that gave them an indication of what the rest would produce. That's what Christ is, is our first fruits. When we saw Christ, when he rose from the dead and he walked for 40 days on this earth, uh, and repaired to the apostles, appeared to 500 people, appeared to all these people, he's given us a glimpse of what we're going to be like in the afterlife. 
we are his bride, he's the bridegroom. It would look kind of silly, wouldn't it, if we just stayed in our spirits. Once we died, we just remained in our spirits. And we follow Christ around in eternity, him in his full body, but us in spirits. We will have resurrected bodies. The first question that we're going to analyze today concerns the period between the moment we die and the final day of judgment. Where are those who die during this period? Do they continue to exist in some disembodied state or just cease to exist until the final day? And that's what he called what some people in the church soul sleep. Let me give you a, a quick answer on that, then we'll get more into it in a few minutes. Never in the Bible does it say soul sleep. Never. It talks about the body being asleep, but never the soul. And throughout Christian history, for over 2,000 years, 99.567% have believed in a disembodied existence, spirit going to Christ. There's only been a handful throughout 2,000 years. It's more prevalent now in certain denominations that believe in soul sleep. But it's never been taught in the church. And I'll get to that when I get to it. But let's start with the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, did they believe that the spirits would leave once they died and be with God. I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I go to Leviticus 19.31. In Leviticus 19.31, listen to these verses. It says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. We'll go to Leviticus 20, verse 6. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. So what, what God is saying, do not consult the dead. Do not consult a medium to try to communicate with the dead. If he, he gives this commandment because that's what people were doing, and he's saying if reality is people were existing, were existing after they died, or he wouldn't have given this commandment. So I'm just giving you a, 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 a reason why even in the Old Testament, they believe that once you died, your spirit went to God. You can look at uh, the, the phrase, sleeping with one's ancestors, and that's used ten times in the Pentateuch, and that's Genesis through De Deuteronomy. The fact that he used of Jacob several months before his actual burial rules out any identification with burial itself. And in other words, it does not refer to being placed in a family tomb, since Abraham, Moses, and Aaron were not buried with their ancestors. Okay? Therefore, it suggests that being united with them in the afterlife. There were people, still I think today, that believe once you die, you stay in the ground, or that you have to recover the body and place it in a tomb that you, you purchase for your family so they'll all be together. But what scripture is saying is that when Abraham, Moses, and Aaron died, they were not placed in their family tomb. But then what does Jesus say to the Sadducees? In Luke 20, verse 38, in Luke 20, verse 38, you'll recognize these verses. He says, Matter of fact, I'll start at verse 27. And some of the Sadducees, who denied that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her as, as wife, and he died a childless. Then the third took her, and in like manner, the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. They're trying to make, they're trying to make a joke about the afterlife. It doesn't make any sense to the human mind about the afterlife. And this is Jesus' response to him. 
Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are accounted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection, not angels, but like angels. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. So he's saying when, when the Moses, Abraham, David, all the patriotics died, they went to be with God. You see, he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. That's what he's saying to them. Now, do the Sadducees, did they... Uh, refute the resurrection actually where they got their information from was in the intertestamental literature in between the old and new testament obviously the new testament wasn't written at that time and i i read some of that and what they believe a lot of people believe in those writings was soul sleep so what the sadducees are saying is we believe there is a resurrection but that's at the end of the world we believe that when you die, you just cease to exist until that time. A lot of them thought that. That's why they denied the bodily resurrection, not resurrection itself. So Jesus is addressing both issues with the Sadducees. The future, the future resurrection and the immediate disembodied state is what Jesus is answering there. Uh, the three patriarchs he used are alive and remain alive in the presence of God, even though their bodies have returned to dust. The part of us that survives at death will be reunited with our bodies at the second coming. Matthew 10, 28. In Matthew 10, 28, it says, and do not, this is Jesus saying this, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather let fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he's, Jesus is making a distinction. There's the difference between a body and a soul. We, we, people are able to kill our bodies right now, but not our spirits, not our souls. Our souls go immediately into the presence of God upon death. Hebrew, well, Luke 23, 30, 43, remember the, the thief on the cross? When Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now that wouldn't make any sense if there was not paradise existing at that moment. And where do we find that? We find that in 1 Corinthians, or make that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 through 4. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul states, and he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one, I will pull on, let me start at verse 2. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know. Now that's important. Paul is saying that 14 years ago I was transported to the heaven. And whether I was in the body or not, I don't know. It doesn't matter at this point. God knows. And such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. See, when we die and our spirit goes to be to, in heaven, we're going to be perfected. We're going to think it doesn't get any better. We're completely satisfied being a spirit. But we know that one day we will be reunited with our bodies, and it will get better. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for man to utter. So Paul's saying, I was caught up to paradise. I was in the realm where we go when we die. Jesus says on the cross to the thief, today you will be with me in this place. Now we can do all this fancy grammar talk, is what some groups do, to try and say that's not what the grammar is saying. The grammar is saying, today I tell you this, that one day you'll be in paradise. No, that's not what grammar is saying. He's saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. One of my favorites, but we might have time, is Hebrews 2, 20, 12, 23, when the spirits made perfect are located with God and angels in heaven. This, I'm going to read it. 
In Hebrews 12.23, in Hebrews 12.23, listen to these, these verses. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's us. That's us. When we die, our spirits are perfected and we're in heaven. He's not talking about the resurrection yet in this part, but one day our bodies will be reunited with our spirits. So when we die, our soul goes to an intermediate state while our bodies remain behind. This is not a permanent separation, though it's only temporary. Without a body, a person is incomplete. Therefore, what death would temporarily separate, God will one day reunite. And that's the importance of the resurrection. But before I get to soul sleep, Let's look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 24. You'll recognize these verses. It says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. What? I'm on verse 27. Verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to, be, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I am really convicted. <coughs> and thank you, Rita, for suggesting Philippians. Because I'm going through Philippians and I am convicted. Well, that's another story. We have to come Wednesday. <laughs> but right here, he's saying so much in this whole book. But for Paul, life means Christ. For to me to live is Christ. To Paul, his life is Christ. And he makes these statements all through the uh, all through Scripture, especially Philippians three eight. Remember Philippians three eight. He says. Uh, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So in this life, when Paul is in jail, he's suffering in jail, but in this life, he, he can't think of any. He wants to stay here. I'll get to that in a second. But his whole life is Christ. No matter what his circumstances are, he wants to glorify and exalt Christ and help other people. Give them encouragement. Pagan belief, I've mentioned this before, view death as a release from one's burdens and labors. Death released you from earthly troubles. That's how people, especially Egyptians, as Sylvia was saying, that's how they viewed life. Paul had a different view. Now this is, this is going to get touchy here. At least it did for me. Paul had a different view concerning death. Okay? He did not regard earthly life as insignificant, but rather a time to glorify God and continue to serve Him. No matter what your circumstances are at, if God wants you here, if it's His dining table, we need to not complain and be with God and serve Him no matter what your health issues are are, no matter what you're going through, no matter the bad news you keep getting in your family and whatnot, if God wants you here, we need to enjoy this time and help other people with our life. Not take the shortcut out of this life, but to, to glorify God no matter what you're going through in this life. His troubles and circumstances gave him the opportunity to glorify and reveal God's power and strength in other believers. You see, Paul, to the unbeliever, let's look at it this way, to the unbeliever on earth, earth is all there is to the unbeliever. It is natural, natural for them to strive for the world's values, money, popularity, power, and wealth, pleasure. For the Christian, for us, the Christian life means to develop eternal values. 
and tell others about Christ. Because he alone is the one who can change other people's values to start thinking about eternity. But listen, but, but, but Paul in verse 22, in verse 22 he says, um, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet when I say I choose, I cannot tell. Paul is saying that being alive is a gift and I'm responsible to use it. Fruitful labor is a must. Now, but remember, for all of us, all of us, you're not going to know 99%, maybe even more, you're not going to know the fruit that you're bearing for Christ in this life. You're not. Otherwise, you'd be pretty arrogant. You're not going to understand, but I guarantee you the day you die, even though you think you were of no use for God's kingdom, you were. I guarantee you were. There are people watching you. There are words that you've said that has probably nothing even to do with the gospel that has hit somebody's heart and they can't get it out of their minds. Your fruit will be evidence when you get to heaven of everybody God used you for. So don't ever think that your life is insignificant because it's not. Because he was ready to die, he was ready to live. Because he did not know if he was going to get out of prison or not. He belonged to Christ and was confident of his eternal destination so he could do no, donate his life on earth to living for Christ. And you know what the, I, it, the thing with Philippians? It's genius. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God's word. Paul's saying, I don't know what's better for me. To depart and be with Christ or to stay here and be a benefit for you. Think that's kind of a no-brainer for us, isn't, isn't it? But Paul's making a point here. Paul's saying it's about other people. Okay? If it means I have to continue to be tortured, persecuted in this life, it's God's will for me, and I want to be a benefit, especially to the church, but to other people. And then he goes into Philippians 2 and talks about what Christ did for us. He came to earth for us, not for himself. He came to give himself for us. And this is what Paul's trying to teach the Philippians. It's about other people. It's not about you. Even if it might be better to go to heaven right now, get out of all your toils and troubles. But God wants you here. It's about other people, not about your comfort. That's what Paul's saying. And in verse 23, it gives us a good scripture. gives us what happens to us when we die. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. People are not waiting in purgatory or in soul sleep. We go immediately in, into heaven. Let's talk about soul sleep just for a few minutes. The word sleep is intended to apply to the body. But that's what sleeps. Matthew 27, 52. These are some verses you've all read but it is no one can really give a true answer to this I don't think we should in Matthew 27 53, 52 this is when Jesus dies on the cross okay? and there's a moment, momentous thing that just happened God of the universe became a sin offering and in verse 51 it says then behold the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. It's the body that's asleep, not the soul. I don't know where the word soul sleep came from. It's the body. The bodies that were at rest, that were asleep, came to life, reunited their spirit, and they went into town. Then they died again. They died again. But you know what? That, that, the only thing I can say on that verse is that is the momentous thing that happened when Christ died. It was such a momentous time in history, it's like the whole creation overturned. That's huge what happened. But the New Testament offers no sustained reflection on the intermediate state. We have Philippians 1, 21 here. We have 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10, which we'll look at a little bit next week. But other than that, there's really no sustained reflection on what happens when you leave this 
uh, when you leave this life until the second coming. And why is that? We can go to the First Thessalonians chapter 4. We all know those verses. 13 through 18, the trumpet of God sounds and the dead in Christ will rise first and meet God in the air. You see, when Paul was writing that, he was reflecting not upon the situation they were presently, he was addressing the situation of the sleeping Christians. He wasn't addressing that issue. He's addressing more about the future place of the second coming. He didn't really give an answer of what they asked him. Well, what about those that have died? Are they going to miss the resurrection? Are they going to miss the rapture? Remember those verses in 1 Thessalonians? Paul doesn't address that issue. He just says they're not going to miss anything. They're going to be with us at the moment Christ returns. He could have, at that moment, if the Holy Spirit wanted to, he could have gave a whole dialogue about what happens to us when we die. But he didn't. And you know, why would, if we did, it's like heaven. When they talk about heaven in scripture, a lot of it's metaphoric. Because our minds can't I comprehend what's in store for us. It can't. And you know what would happen? Because we're sinners still. We still have sin in our mind that we have to battle. We're going to be perfected spirits soon, and then we're going to be reunited with our bodies. But what would happen if God gave a whole detail about heaven, answered every question you could want to know about heaven? We'd be thinking about that and be no earthly use for him here. And so he's telling the Philippians... Be prepared for the second coming. Don't worry so much about all the details about when you die to the second coming. Keep focused on him returning. That's what the focus should be on. So you don't have to give elaborate discussions when people say it just doesn't make any sense. Where does it say what happens to us the moment we die? You can look at these verses, but they still have the argument against it. You don't have to give them the answer because there really is no clear answer. Obviously, heaven is far better than remaining on earth. But we must obey God and remain in work as he sees fit. We must avoid two errors with that. One is we must work. One error that we commit is to work and lose sight of our ultimate home with Christ and desire only to be home with God and neglect the work that he has called us to. You see, we need to have our hope centered on heaven, on, on God, but don't let that stop you from being any good here on earth. If the Lord wants you to stay here suffering, persecuted, whatever, be joyful in that. Rejoice in all circumstances, like Paul says. One day you will be with God in heaven, and you will see him face to face. You see, um, currently, heaven is a spiritual realm. There's no need for temporary physical bodies in the place where we go right now. And it's only my opinion here, so just hear me out. We wait for the new heavens and the new earth, right? Where we will receive our resurrected and glorified physical bodies. There's no need for it now. And God's wisdom when we die, our spirit goes immediately with Christ. We're in complete joy, complete perfection. But one day, when he has the new heavens and the new earth, we receive our resurrected bodies, and we will rejoice in being in that area. In other words, it continues to get better. Before I finish, when I was thinking about Paul being in prison, uh, and being joyful, I came upon this. And I'm probably going to say his name wrong. But you see, we live in a culture that thinks of physical death with such dread that society's highest goal is the postponement of death as long as possible. You go and talk to people, they want to postpone death as long as possible because they're afraid of what happens to them when they die. We are so obsessed with physical life that we are willing to deny it to countless unborn children too small and weak to defend themselves in order to prove the quality of the life of the strong. Death is the worst possible event for those who believe that they have a right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Denying its existence seems to be how we cope with it. We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to cope with it. Me, divide 
was in prison by the government of Iran in 1984 when he converted from Islam to Christianity. The penalty for this crime was death. He languished in prison for 10 years before his case came to trial. And when it did, this is his written statement concerning his defense. Jesus Christ is our Savior, and he's a Son of God. To know him means to know eternal life. I, a useless sinner, wow, have, having believed in his beloved person and all his words and miracles recorded in the gospel, <laughs> and I have committed my life into his hands. Life for me is an opportunity to serve him, and death is a better opportunity to be with Christ. Therefore, I am not only satisfied to be in prison for the honor of his holy name, but I'm ready to give my life for the sake of Jesus, my Lord. On December 12, 1993, the court sentenced him to death. But under pressure from some people in the West and other countries who knew about the case, Iran released him in January of 1994. Seven months later, he was found dead under suspicious circumstances in a Tehran park, the third Christian murdered in Iran after being released from prison. But beloved, he just said, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He had a death sentence on him for that. And then he was released from prison. And he said, if God wants me here to serve him, to serve people here, that's where I'm at. But seven months later, he's reunited with his Lord and Savior. 